Jnanatimrandasya Jnananjana Slakya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guravenam Guravei Gaura Chandraya Radikai Tadale Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tad Bhaktaya Namo Namah Ananda Lila Maya Vigrahaya Ema Bhagavad Chabi Sundaraya Tasmai Mahaprema Rasapradaya Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste First of all, I offer my Sastanga Dandavat Puspanjali, my heart like flowers, thousands of times, at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Gurudev, Asmadeya Paramarajatam Guru Pada Padma, Nitilila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pada, Achtodara Satasishima Guru Panuga Charivarya, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Mahan. Secondly, I bow down thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Vanchakal for Guru Prasthakarakas. Please come with me to the shore of the ocean. In Jagannath Puri. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. Being so beautiful, decorated with the golden complexion of Srimati Radhika and imbued with her sentiments, that is Sri Chaitani Mahaprabhu, is very mercifully instructing his associates in the Nam Rahasya, the secrets of the Holy Name. For a person who is chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the only thing that is standing between him and the endless ocean of bhakti rasa are these ten obstacles the ten offenses mahapur's guru had instructed him krishna nama ma mantra eto subhav Jai Japi Se Krishna Upa Jai Bhav It is the very nature of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that if one repeats it then Bhav Transcendental Ecstasy will awaken in his heart Srila Ishwara Puri Pada Sikhi Sikhi Mahaprabhu Сказал, что Как только человек начинает повторять Hare Krishna Maha Mantra Transcendental чувство любви Бхава появляется в его сердце That's a very swabhav That means the inherent nature of the mantra that that's what it does to you but just as the light of the sun is not experienced when one is uh, below the dark clouds so similarly for one whose heart is clouded by the ten types of anti-devotional dispositions uh, then they do not experience the awakening of love upon chanting the Holy Name. So the first one, and Satam Ninda to criticize the devotees who are spreading yeah, the glories of the Holy Name. Srila Sri Swami in his commentary on Bhagavatam gives a definition of the word Ninda. He said Ninda Dosha Kirtanam. 
It means to chant the faults of someone. There is no uh, consideration of whether the faults are true or not. In other words, there's not a license. If the fault about a person is actually true, so then I can speak it. I should only not speak it if it's false. No. Ninda means doshikirta. Silu Rupaga Swami has uh, mentioned in Upadashamrita that um, drishta subhava janita vapushasta dosha na prakutaptamiya bhakta janasya patsyat. By our material vision, one may see two types of faults in a pure devotee. One is related to the body. Or the devotee has some uh, illness. Or maybe when devotees become old, they have to wear spectacles or hearing, hearing aid. Then you say, how can this person be perfect? His uh, eyes are not perfect, his hearing is not perfect, he's perfect, why? Because he never makes the mistake of thinking that the material world is for his enjoyment. He's perfect because he never forgets Krishna. He's perfect because everything he does is out of love for Krishna. So there's no fault. The other type of fault is Svobhav. Svobhav does. It means that, let's say, if a Vaishnava is born in a, in a lower caste, then he may not have the airs and graces of someone born in an aristocratic, in the in a very high class Brahmin family. So perhaps his language may be a little rough. Or it's seen sometimes when Vaishnavas become old, sometimes they may become a little short tempered. It seems. Hey, don't do that. So, or their memory, maybe when they're old, sometimes they don't remember something. So, this is a, not an impediment to devotion. This is superficial. And it should be seen just like the Ganges. The Ganges is pure and transcendental, but now, especially in Kali Yuga, it's full of pollution. There can be so much uh, uh, sewage and trash floating in the Ganges these days. Rupa Goswami doesn't give that. He said bubbles, foam and mud. In the rainy season, there may be bubbles and foam, which is considered being pure. So, uh, but the Ganges, if you bow down to the Ganges, if you worship the Ganges, you pray to her, you make offerings to her, then her mercy will come. So in the same way, whatever faults are visible, in the nature, the, the nature or in the body of a pure Vaishnava, they're not in impediments. Because the flow of bhakti is there, if you bow down, if you pray, if you serve, if you worship, then the, the nectar of devotion comes to us. So, Ninda means to speak of the so-called faults, whether true or not. It should be avoided. Because one incurs the displeasure of Krishna. Krishna is very upset. Because devotees are dear to him. Now, if one makes a f an offense to a devotee, knowingly or unknowingly, then one should go and apologize and bow down and beg for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, the devotee, of course, in a general sense, is very humble and will say, no, no problem. If it were a very uh, severe offense, then maybe he will not forgive you straight away for your own benefit. Eh? So that you will think, oh, I should uh, act in such a way to please him. Mm -hmm. So, 
One should not only ask for forgiveness, but one should <coughs> render service visibly and also vi invisibly. Services which are known and services which are not known to others. Until the heart of that Vaishnava becomes very, very favorable towards you. Because if Vaishnava will forgive, and it's in most cases he did not even take offense. But Krishna takes offense. And Krishna will give some heavy reaction. And there's no escaping it. His Sudarshan Chakra will come and chase you and finish you. Not in one lifetime, but it may. The, the reaction may last for many lifetimes. And one will become, one can become like a demon even for lifetimes until the effect of the offense wears off. So, how can we be sure if the Vaishnava has forgiven us? Or he never took offense in the first. How can we be sure that Krishna has forgiven us? That's important. So, the scriptures enjoin that one should try to serve and please that devotee. In such a way that not only does he you know, forgive you, but He's so pleased that he, he decides, oh, you will be my Kripa Patra. I want to give you most. Huh? So when he feels Anugraha, you become the Anugraha Patra, the object of his compassion. Then Krishna is satisfied. And then one becomes free from any reaction to that offense. So, so mm -hmm. then one should not consider the name, form, qualities and pastimes to be the, the separate realities. Krishna's form, qualities, everything, they are not different from his name. And one should not consider uh, Lord Shiva to be separate from him. He is one with Krishna in terms of his uh, a great loving devotee of Krishna. But even though he is a part of the reality of Krishna and his devotees, you should not think that the qualities, the name, form and qualities of Shiva are independent from Sri Krishna. Because whatever uh, power is there in Shiva and other devotees has all come from Krishna. No one is independent from Krishna. Then Guru Avagya. We have discussed Guru Advagya. I just add some point. <coughs> to uh, disrespect the spiritual master. One way in which it can come is this. There are many pundits who are learned in subjects such as etymology, grammar, jyotish, astrological shastra, in the performance of all different types of karma kanda rituals which are described in the Vedas and so on. So there may be a guru who is always speaking about the glories of the holy name. So then a person may think, oh, he's always talking about the holy name, but he doesn't know all the details of Nyai, Vaisheshik, and Purvami Mangsa, and all different Saddarshans, and so on. He's just speaking these simple things about the holy name. This is an offense. Yeah? To think that there is something lacking in the Guru who has realization of the name. Because the name is everything. Name is the fruit of all the Vedas. So this is an important point. Another important point is this. That a person hears the glories of the Holy Name and thinks, this is wonderful. I will chant. I will just chant. But he, in his life he doesn't accept a Guru. He thinks the holy name has been glorified in the scripture. By the holy name one can get praying. So why do I need to take a guru? It's very inconvenient. So a person who is reluctant to take shelter of a guru, who is relishing the pure name, considering it to be an inconvenience, Okay. Even though he chants the holy name, will not get the mercy of the holy name because Guru Avadya, 
neglect of guru tattva. Mm -hmm. So in the first examples, we're giving examples of how one makes the offense of minimizing or neglecting one spiritual master. But if you don't have a spiritual master, then you can't make that offense. No, because by refusing to uh, accept in principle that you need a guru or accepting a guru in your life, due to thinking that it's inconvenient and the holy name will give mercy without without guru uh, then this this is also guru avagya the, the negligence or disrespect of guru tattva the prin, guru in principle so then suti shastra nindanam vedayatiti vedaha Vedas mean that which reveals itself. The Vedas reveal themselves. They are known by themselves. Vedayatiti Vedaha. So they have no human source. They are Aparusheya. So if a person has some mm, doubts this, that they think that the scriptures have a human origin, or that they have some, they can uh, be mistaken inaccurate then uh, this is no uh, uh, minimizing the scripture it's also considered an offense to the holy now to consider that the glories of chanting of the holy name are an exaggeration now I'll give you a very prime example in the Rig Veda, original Sruti, Rig Veda, there it is said, Om Asya Jananto Nama Chidvivikthan Mahaste Vishnu Sumatim Bajamahe Om Tat Sat The wishes of praying. Oh my Lord, Asya Jananto It means, Oh my Lord, we know something about you. Mm. To the word Asya, the letter A is added. A, Asya. A means a little. Jananto. We know something about you, my Lord. But we don't know, that means we, but we don't know you perfectly. Mm. But how wonderful it is that Namachid mm, Viviktan Mahaste that simply by the repetition of your names Sumatim Bajamahe Bajamahe means we will attain Sumatim a very full realization by Chidvivaktan here Srila Jiva Goswami explains it means Aksha Abhyas the repetition of the syllables. Why? Because Om, Om is the name of God, Tat. That name of God, Sat. Sat means Swatta Siddha, self-manifesting. Now just consider it very carefully. The Vedas are saying, that simply by the repetition of the syllables of the name ha re krishna ha re krishna that you become enlightened because the name is self-revealing so there are many devotees who say no. This is all the idea that you just chant the name and realize Krishna. This is for the neophytes. The advanced devotees know that when you are chanting, you have to exactly know now it's 1028, and at this time, Krishna is going into the he's just left the village of Braj and he's doing this pastime. And they try to uh, make some very special, important type of involved creative visualization and think that if you don't do that while you're chanting then you can never 
attain Christopher? Если люди, они считают, ну это воспевание имен для новичков продвинутые, мы должны совершать визуализацию, медитацию, когда мы повторяем все эти имена, мы должны посмотреть на часы и знать, что это 10. 24. Сейчас Кришна находится в такой-то точке Вриндавана. Мне надо представить, как я служу ему таким особым образом, потому что если я не буду вот так медитировать, в кавычках, то so, не получу ни никаких результатов. От if someone says, oh, just by the repetition of the syllables, Nam reveals himself. И если им сказать нет, просто повторением слогов святого имени. Either they don't believe it, but if you show it to them, then they think, oh, it's an exaggeration. И, и они или не поверят. Или если им показать это в шастре, они скажут, ну это просто привлечение. So this is a very big problem. Опять это проблема. Yes, it's true. When you chant the holy name, then the advanced devotees are meditating on Astakali Lila. But they're not imagining it. The name is revealing it. Это правда, что продвинутый возвышенный преданный видит Лилу Кришну, медитирует на Лилу Кришну во время повторения Харинамы, но он не визуализирует это сам. And the name will not reveal that Lila until he's revealed first the form. The qualities, the associates, the yoga pit lila, and then the astakali lila. So if a person is thinking, I am meditating on astakali lila, but even the form of Krishna is not being revealed to them, then they they're doing the uh, there is a vyutkram. Vyutkram means the compromise of the sequence. So when one tries to do bhajan but there is a vyutkram, the compromising of the sequence, then you cannot make progress. But the cause of the vyutkrama is that you don't believe in this glorification of the holy name Om Tat Sat. If someone says it, they think it's an exaggeration. Now, that's the general meaning of Tathatavadu. Hari Nam Nikalpanam. Tathatavad. There's a very specific meaning of the word Artavad. In the Vedas, there are descriptions of how to perform sacrifices. And uh, these descriptions contain uh, two types of statements, Artavad and Vidhi. Vidhi means an injunction. Now you should do this. Now you should light the fire. Now you should bring the goat. Now you should establish the stamba, the pillar. Whatever. There are many different things involved in the ritual. Uh -huh. And in between those statements, there are statements of glorification called artavad. For example, the scripture may say, Vayu Dev is a very swift God. And then it will get so that's Artavad. And then it will say, um, now you should uh, perform this ritual in relation to Vayu. So the purpose of glorifying of the statement glorifying Vayu was to inspire you to do the activity. To understand that doing this activity at this stage in the ritual is praiseworthy. Hmm? And that activity is not the ultimate goal, it's just it's just part of a of a of a larger ritual which has another goal. So, if you if you quote the statement, I'm worshiping Vayu. This is the best thing to do in life. Then someone can say, Well, where's the proof? Well, here it is in this description of this ritual. Uh, but you say, uh, actually, this is Artavad. It is meant to inspire you to then do the part of the ritual which was had a relation with Vayu. Which was part of, which ultimately had another purpose. Mm. 
So the scriptures glorify the holy name. Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Shuddho Nityamukto Binatvam Nama Namano The holy name of Krishna is a wish-fulfilling jewel. It is the embodiment of all rasa. It is fully conscious. Nam is conscious. Don't think I am conscious and I'm just saying this name. This name is more conscious than you. <laughs> this name will give, awaken your consciousness. Chaitanya Rasa Vigra. Chaitanya? Oh, it is, the holy name is complete. It is, co it is also pure and untouched by the material energy. It is eternal. It is unbound, not, it is liberated, not bound by any worldly consideration. But all those adjectives apply only really to God, to the fullest degree. So yes, Abhinatvam Nama Nama Nama, yes, the name is God. None different from Krishna. So you quote this, then someone can say, ah, that's art of art. It's just a statement in, uh, encouraging you to do a duty which is part of a much larger scheme, which is what I'm doing. <laughs> you live like this. So, uh, art, there's such a thing in the Vedas as art of art. And so, the, um, a statement which seems very grand and very glorious can be put in its proper perspective by analyzing it, understanding it to be art of art. But if you do that with the statements of the Vedas that glorify the holy name, then it becomes this offense. And you you are doing that because Harinam Nikalpanam it's your imagination. Kalpanam means imagination. So sometimes that line is taken as one offense. Huh? And then attentiveness is taken to be inattentive is taken as a, as another offense. So the the, the the categorization is ten offenses is, is given like that. But other sadhus have divided this line into two parts. One offense is to interpret the glories of the name in scripture to be artavad, and then Hari Namni Kalpanam is considered to be a separate offense. So Hari Namni Kalpanam means to do Kalpana to apply your imagination to interpret the holy names. For example, someone may see a devotee is chanting and he is very blissful. And then he may think, oh, just see. <laughs> By saying this mantra over and over again, he's hypnotized himself. <laughs> you know, a hypnotist can hypnotize you and say, and say, oh, it's freezing, today is very, and you start shivering. <laughs> or the hypnotist may say, oh, today it's very hot, and then the audience who are hypnotized start to sweat. Hmm? So hypnotism can have some... Sometimes a, a person cannot give up smoking, so they go to hypnotists and hypnotizes them. You do not smoke, you hate smoking, then when he comes out of his trance, then he says, oh, I don't want to see. So someone is thinking that these people are chanting and they're hypnotizing themselves to be happy. So they've made some imaginary interpretation and projected it onto the name. Or another thing, is very important. It is the view of the impersonalists. They think that, seriously, this is their philosophy, that only the light of Brahman is true. Nothing else is even real. But because our mind is uncontrolled, so we don't realize it. 
Они говорят, просто из-за того, что наш ум не обузданный, мы не понимаем. So in order to control the mind, we use this tool, which is called the mantra. И они считают, что мантра это просто инструмент, который мы используем для того, чтобы... So the sages of there's no such thing, God is not real, it's everything is illusion. But the sages have imagined uh, a God and given some imaginary names to that God. And we use those imaginary names as a tool to concentrate our mind so that we can realize that everything is illusion, only Brahman is true. So all these people you are meeting in Thirumalai and everything, this is actually what they do. So it doesn't matter whether you chant in the name of Krishna or Shiva or Durga or Ganesha, just, you just imagine that there's a God and give him a name and then just repeat it over and over again as a tool to control your mind and attain liberation. Very offensive. Very offensive. Now, on a deep level, Kalpana or imagination we do all the time. We do it all the time. Our very perception of the world is vikalpa, imaginary. Because we feel that the world is going on, nothing, no one is in control of it, it's just random um, events taking place. It's just a chaos of random events. And each individual object has its own uh, independent existence. So everything we see, our buddhi, you see vikalpa, imagination, is a, a function of buddhi, your intelligence. So when you see something, first you have a raw, unfiltered experience of the object, that's called uh, near Vikalpa Pratyaksh. And it's a, a split second. You don't even notice it. But your intelligence immediately envelops that object and begins to interpret it. And gives it a location. This is an object in a room on the beach in South India. So your intelligence gives it an, a location and identifies what kind of jati, universal, what kind of category it belongs to. This is a human, this is a dog, this is a tree. And the, all your concepts about it, the intelligence puts over them. The intelligence never thinks Vasudeva Savamiti, everything is God. Which is the reality. Vasudeva Savamiti. There are two things. You are the conscious Shakshi. The witness. So Supreme Lord in the 11th canto, he says that you are not the body, you are not your mind, you are only the conscious witness, that's you. And everything else that you're witnessing, that's me. That's called Krishna consciousness, being conscious of Krishna. That there's nothing exists independently from Krishna. But we don't do that. We wander around seeing this whole... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is that? That's Vikalpa. That's our intelligence has gone over the objects. And and we have no awareness of God because we're interpreting, we're misinterpreting the entirety of our existence. Due to uncontrolled mind. So one may say, Hari Namni Kalpanam. I am doing Kalpana all the time with all things. So then how can I not do it with the holy name? So Srila Jiva Goswami part, he said that you should not interpret the name with your intelligence in such a way which diminishes its glory. Mm -hmm. 
so, so the answer to this is that you have to maintain the abhinna bhav. Always maintain the conception. This name is Krishna himself. And chant. And if you don't do that, then your mind will automatically start just uh, creating, imagining, and interpreting the name in different ways. This name is Krishna. This name is Shama Sundar. This name is Yashoda Nandan, the son of Yashoda. You fixed in that and check. And so Hari Nam Nikapa. Then the next offense. Nam Nobala Dhyasa Ipapa Buddhi. To, con to commit sins on the strength of chanting the holy name. So Vaikunta Nam Grahanam Ashesha Agam Haram Vidu. Viduhu. The holy name is so powerful that it destroys more sins than it's even possible for you to commit. But knowing this, you should not use the name as a license to continue uh, performing sinful activities. You should not think, I know this activity is very bad. But, because I am chanting every day, I'll sing, and then I'll chant, and then the reaction will go away, and then I can do it again and chant, and the reaction will go away. So, if one uses the holy name as a free pass for sinning, it's a great offense. Now, What is very important to note here is that sins, pap, can be destroyed in a moment by Nam Abhas. Just the semblance of the name. But offenses linger for a long time. It's very difficult to overcome offenses. So if deliberately one sins on, on the strength of chanting, then actually it's no longer a pap. Nama Bas will not uh, easily get rid of this, but rather it becomes an offense. And it's very hard to change one's character. It's very hard to change one's personality and change that habit once you develop that habit. One name destroys all sins. One Nama Bas destroys all sins. But now you are not chanting Nama Bas anymore. So Nama Bas cannot destroy your sin. Because you are not chanting Nama Bas. And furthermore, it is said here, Nam Nyobala Papa Buddhi Navinda Te Tasa Yamahi Shuddhi means a person may think, okay, if the name Nama Bas will not purify because I'm chanting the Aparad, I can purify myself by doing uh, Astanga Yoga. <laughs> So he says, No, yam, yamai, it's in the plural. It means by following the yams and niyams. Those are the first two angas of, of Astanga Yoga. Yam and niyam. By following, and by Lakshana Briti, by association, it means all the practices of Astanga Yoga will not be able to purify a person who's developed this mentality. Srila Sanatan Goswami gives another uh, translation, uh, interpretation of the words Yamai. Yam can mean Yamaraj, the god of death. So in this universe there's only one Yam, 
one Why god of death. And so how come Yamai, plural, you cannot be purified by many gods of death? Huh? That means that in the cycle of the universe, when the universe is destroyed, then another person becomes Yamraj, and then another one. So it means even throughout many cycles of the universe, many Yamrajis are coming and going, and all of them are torturing you, but still you'll not be purified from, by, from this, by many Yams. So Sila Sanatan Goswami Pada has given this uh, uh, interpretation. Srila Vishnu Chakitakura said, anyone who chants the holy name, even if they're committing some offenses, they'll never see Yamaraj. <laughs> so you cannot uh, 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 say that that person you cannot take it literally that that person cannot be purified by so many Yamarajas, meaning that they'll go to Yamaraj and they'll be purified and will come to no end. So you should not interpret it literally, because a person who is chanting and even committing offenses, Yamaraj will not touch that person. But the idea is that that person is very wicked. And they will not attain praying. What, suf what suffering could be more suffering than not attaining love for Krishna? There's nothing worse than that. Being To be excommunicated from Goloka Vrindavan. It's actually from the absolute point of view that's the most terrible thing that you possibly have. So then the next offense Dhamma Bharata Tyaga Hutadi Sarava Shubakriya Samnamapi Pramada. It means that there are in this world activities which are relatively auspicious called Shubakriya. Dharma, Prata, Tyaga, Huta, Adi. So Dharma means following the rules and regulations of Varnashram Dharma. The duties according to your Ashram, Brahmachari, Grihasta, Vanaprastha, Sanyas. Following your duties according to your caste, you may be a Brahmin, a Kshatriya, a warrior, a Vaishya, a farmer, in agriculture, a Sudra, a laborer. So everyone has their duties according to Varna and Ashram. And following this is called Dharma. It includes Tapasa Brahmacharya na Samena Cha Damena Cha Chagena Satisocha Bhyam Yamena Niyamenava Observing celibacy, performing austerities, always being truthful, being detached, and so on. All of these things are different aspects of Dharma. And what and their function is that they purify a person, uh, taking them from the lower gunas, Tamagun, through Rajagun up to Sattvagun. But this is all material. Even to move, to be elevated through the gunas is just to go from one material aspect of the material energy to another aspect of the material energy. But the chanting of the holy name is fully transcendental. So if one equalizes, if one compares the chanting of the holy name with the performance of dharmic activities, this is an offense to the holy name, to Nam Prabhu. So Dharma Vrat, there can be vows that you perform. Uh, like prayastita, uh, atonements for sins and so on, for purifying you. But no vrat, 
can be equal to the holy name. Нельзя приравнивать никакие враты. Враты это обеты, которые человек берет, чтобы искупить какую-то вину, очиститься. Тоже нельзя приравнивать. Ни один брат не может приравняться к силе святого. Тяга means renunciation. Тяга. Accepting sannyas. If one thinks that accepting sannyas is equal to chanting Hare Krishna, it's offense to the holy. Dama Bharata Tyaga Hut Hutta means performing fire sacrifices. So all of these activities, they're all material. And chanting is transcendental. So they should never be equalized. You should never consider them to be similar in your mind. So we can give there are many examples. For example, Ajamil. Ajamil was doing sacrifices every day. He was following his dharma every day. And what happened? One day when he saw so the bad behavior of a very low class uh, woman and uh, a drunk man, then he, he became uh, bewildered, contaminated by that, and he himself fell down. It means that Dharma, Brata, Tyaga, Huta, all of these activities, though they are relatively purifying, they cannot completely or permanently purify a person. Here, Adi, Adi means etc. So it would include Gyan, cultivating the philosophical knowledge. So Ajamil, he was doing all of these things, but still he became entangled in sinful activities. Why? If you take a, some, a jar, a clear jar of dirty water and you just leave it, what happens? All the sediment settles down to the bottom and now the water looks clear. But if you get a stick and stir it, then you'll see it's filthy. So this is how the purification process takes place by Dharma, Bharata, Tyaga, Gyan, all of these things. It doesn't make a permanent and complete purification. If, if a situation comes, you may seem very pure, but a situation may come in your life and it will trigger the past samskars. And before you know it, then you become completely wretched again. It is said that if a person is in this world of birth and death, and you give them the path of Gyan, philosophical discrimination, the cultivation of knowledge. Huh? It is exactly like giving a garland and sandalwood paste to a starving person. It's very nice if someone gives you a garland and decorates you with sandalwood paste. You feel cool and relaxed. And it's fragrant. Okay, it's nice. But a starving person needs food. And if you give him sandalwood paste and a garland, or oh, you've decorated him, but he's still in the same starving condition. So just giving gyan, the nati nati, not this, not this, to a person who's in this world is like that. So Shukadev Goswami describing the situation of of Ajamil. He said Tapasa Brahmacharya na Samayanacha. He was celibate. He always told the truth. He was uh, detached. Uh, he was uh, following his Dharma. He did yams and niyams of yoga. He did everything. But look what happened to him. Venu Gulma Ina 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 Lavaha. Uh, this means 
Next. Venu gulma analiva. It means that if there's a forest of bamboo. Venu gulma ivana laha. It means if there's a forest of bamboo and there's a fire. Then the forest is destroyed. But as soon as rain comes, the whole forest grows back because even though the trees were burnt, the roots were still in the ground. So in this way, Dharma, Thaga, Huta, all these things, Vrata, which are said to be auspicious and purifying, they burn the forests. That means they destroy your sins. But the tendency to commit sin, the Papa Beach, is still there. And given the, the um, an inauspicious environment, it will everything will grow back again. You must understand that this way, the right behavior, the rules of conduct, the rules of некую защиту, то есть они сжигают грехи, но они не способны сжечь склонность к грехам. But и он... если создается какая-то неблагоприятная обстановка, обстоятельства, то человек может очень быстро опять деградировать, потому что желание сгрешить, оно еще прячется там. Внутри. On the other hand, Shukadev Goswami said, Kechit kevalaya bhaktya vasudeva parayana agandunvan akasnaya niharamiva baskara in the morning time, you see mist, fog. And before the sun rises, just when the first rays of the sun appear, then that mist disappears. So in the same way, the Kechit Kevalaya only pure bhakti, the appear, just even before the appearance of pure bhakti, but just when pure bhakti is beginning to appear, then all sins are destroyed in such a way that they can never return. So, uh, even Nam Abbas not only destroys sin, but destroys Pap Beach, the seed of sin also. The tendency to commit sin in the future. Therefore, it's a great offense to compare Dhamma, Bharata, Tyaga, Huta, Adi, Sarava, to Bhakriya, Samnama, Pi, Pramada. To compare the performance of purificatory activities of this world with the transcendental chanting of the Holy Name. Don't ever compare. And therefore, it is said that 100 million Ashwamedha Yagyas should not be compared with just one name of Krishna. For this reason, that is not out of art exaggeration. Understand the metaphysical principles behind the statement. Your yagyas will burn the forest, but the seeds will still be there. And the one holy name will destroy the seeds in the ground also. So then, the next offense, Asraddhadane vimukhe pyasindrati yaschopadesha shiva nama parada. The meaning is, if a person has not developed faith, vimukhe, vimuk, their attention is turned away from Krishna. Asrinvati, they, they are not inclined to listen. Then Upadesh, just to Upadesha, 
to give instructions to those persons about the holy name is an offense. Now one may say, but we're going everywhere and telling people about the name. But you should know that. Uh, first of all, if they're coming and sitting and listening, so by listening they're starting to develop some faith. How will someone develop faith if they don't listen? And also, uh, it's very important, the word Upadesh means to give instruction, but in Vedic culture the context is to give initiation. Упадеш means mantra Упадеш, to give initiation. So this verse is telling, until the audience have developed faith and an eagerness to hear and to know about the holy name and Krishna, if you give them initiation, then you commit offense to the name. Why? Why would a person give initiation to a person who hasn't developed faith and will not chant? Because the person who is giving wants to make disciples. He himself is not interested in serving Nam Prabhu. He is not interested in helping others realize the name. He is interested in collecting disciples and followers and fame and money. And he is using the name to achieve his aims. So initiation, 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 initiating everything. Like Unless the, the person has developed sufficient faith first, then the initiation will have no result. So why are you doing it? They will not follow it. So this offense has been given there to prevent unscrupulous persons from utilizing the name as a business. And therefore the scriptures say, that first you should hear from a sadhu. And then when you develop faith, you should take shelter, that is called Guru Pada Shrai. And serve that teacher. And you should stay with the teacher and serve him for at least one year. And develop a relationship and, and develop your faith. Make it more strong. And when there's strong faith between both the Guru and the disciple, after a minimum of one year, then he may give initiation. In this way, this is auspicious for the Guru and for the disciple. The Guru is really serving the name and really helping that soul. And those who are just very cheaply giving initiation to anything that moves, they must have the Anyabilas, other desires, than pure Bhakti. There are some exceptions for great devotees like Nara. Not that he is an exception, he is also following this, but he may initiate someone very easily because he's so powerful, he can just psh, give you a in one second. It doesn't take time to develop because his Narada is so powerful. Even, you know, with Magrari the hunter, he just sprinkled water on him and then Magrari saw all the animals he killed in his life were waiting to eat him and tear him apart for many, many lifetimes and he became afraid and surrendered. So if a guru is like Narad, then he may give a nation, but he's still not committing this offense. Why? He is given faith at once. In a moment he gave faith. Uh, but those who are not on the level of Narada, they should not imitate him. And even those who are on the level of Narada, 
they generally go through the procedure of Guru Pada Shrai, service for some time, then Harinam and then later Diksha. They go through it gradually uh, to uh, set a good example for the world. So if, if, a, if a person will commit this offense, then he'll commit collect so many unqualified disciples. And instead of uh, serving and assisting him in the service of his guru, they just distract him all the time with their various dramas. So the disciples' life is lost and guru's life is lost. So, then the next offense. Mm -hmm. The Sutra Pina Mahatmyam Yapriti Rahito Damaha Aham Mamadi Paramo Namni Sopya Parada Krit. Sutra Pina Mahatmyam. A person heard mm, about the glories of the Holy Name. But still, after hearing, that person, Ya Priti Rahito Dhamma, that Adama, very low person, terrible person, they didn't have affect, feel affection and cultivate an affectionate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Priti means affection, love. Mm. Wanting to please. So, uh, this means that Sutta Pi Nama Mahatmyam. Let's say many persons came to hear from a sadhu about the glories of the name. They were very impressed. This is wonderful. Hearing it, they became detached, so detached from the world. They had the feelings of renunciation. And they decided, I'm going to chant every day. 64 hours. So then they're chanting now. And then they do it for a few weeks. But then they become slack again. They become attached again. And they're not so enthusiastic about chanting. So it means even after hearing and really like hearing and understanding, having some degree of understanding, you try to take shelter of the name, but you did not maintain an affectionate relationship with Nam Prabhu. You become familiar, complacent. Just like in, in this world, two people meet, they fall in love, whatever, they get married, and they're seeing stars and rainbows, and always thinking of each other, but then after a few years, they become familiar, they become complacent, and then they don't care. And then one of them sits and watches TV, and then the other one just eating ice cream, whatever. They, they don't have love for each other. <laughs> so Nam is a person also. So you can be very enthusiastic in the beginning. But if you don't uh, develop more and more affection, if you remain, you don't maintain affection for the name in your life, this is an offense. So, why does this happen? That's described in the second part of the description. Why do we do that? Ahamma madi paramo namni sopya paradakrit. Because we are holding on to the conception of I and mine. You see, just as we mentioned earlier, that our intelligence is doing the vikalpa, interpreting everything around us in a particular way. According to the particular formula that I am this body and mind, and these things belong to me, and these things don't belong to me. These persons belong to me, these persons don't belong to me. The whole worldly way of thinking is a vikalpa, an imagination, 
projected by the rajasic buddhi мирское наше мировоззрение и восприятие реальности это все продукт влияния раджагуны so to be in a loving relationship with krishna you cannot have that attitude and be in a loving relationship with god а невозможно находиться в таком менталитете и любить бога because krishna said to be guna maya bhave ebi savame dam jagat I am above the three gunas and this world is below the three gunas and that's why they don't know me. Said the world, the people of the world don't know me because their consciousness is in the gunas and I am above the gunas. So, this the uh, vikalpa imagination imaginary way in which we interpret the world hmm? which revolves around the concept of aham mameti i and mine and what is not me and not mine as long as we exist as long as we live as long as we remain in that plane of consciousness we cannot know Krishna, realize Krishna, or love Krishna. Мы не сможем ни познать Кришну, ни понять его, ни полюбить его до тех пор, пока мы живем в контексте этого я мое. So since the name is Krishna, and the purpose of chanting the name is to awaken love for Krishna, if we are very rigidly attached to that way of experiencing the world, then it's the antithetical to the serving, knowing and loving Krishna. So, having that mentality is not an offense. Because you have no choice. You have that mentality, your conditioned soul here in this world. But after hearing the glories of the Holy Name and chanting, and the Nam is giving you an alternative, is showing you another way of experiencing the world, then to hold on to the lower, when the Name is offering you the higher consciousness, now this is enough. It's very subtle it means that you are knowingly resisting the mercy of Nam Prabhu. So, Srila Sanatana Swami has given a nice comment on this. He said, Aham Mamadi Paramo. Param means highest or the best. So what is better? Is it better to relinquish the ego and be fully Krishna conscious? Or is it best to be in the course of I and mine? So Aham Mamadi Paramo. This egotistical existence is the best. Or it can mean a person is chanting. And they develop the ego that I am the best chanter. I am chanting more than others. Or if I am not chanting more, but the quality of my chanting is more. Well, my quality is more and my amount is also more. Everything is more. Me and my sadhana is better than everyone else's sadhana. This is another meaning is that Aham Mamadi, me and mine, is superior to Nam. That means I am controlling the name. In other words, uh, when I move my tongue, then the name appears. The word Adin in Sanskrit means subordinate or controlled by. So here Ahamamadi Paramo means I think that the name is Jivadin. 
the name is subordinate to the control of my tongue. И вот это мое настроение, что святое имя, Дживадин, что святое имя подчиняется моему языку. Я его выпускаю на волю, когда я шевелю. But this is illusory. Но это глупость тоже иллюзорная. The name may be Jiva Din when it's a, an offense, it's just a material sound vibration. But the transcendental name is never under the control of your tongue. The transcendental name is a Nam avatar. So just as God controls the entire universe, and sometimes by His sweet will He appears in this world, so in the same way, Nam Prabhu is Supreme Lord controlling the whole universe and by His will the avatar of Nam descends and appears on your tongue. You cannot control it. He is coming Himself. By His mercy. You cannot control Nam. Nam is Krishna. Guru has pure love, he can control Krishna. Guru может so he can also Krishna, control Nam and tell Nam, go and dance on my disciples' tongue. Oh Nam Prabhu, I am very pleased by this disciple. Even Guru doesn't have to say, if Guru is pleased by the disciple, Nam Prabhu himself sets off before disciple will, before Guru will even say anything to him. <laughs> because Krishna is controlled by the love of Guru then. <laughs> but we who are conditioned souls in this world, we cannot control Krishna. But if we please Guru Dev, then Nam Prabhu will come. So Nam is not a Jiva Deen under the control of our tongue. But our tongue is Nama Din, comes under the control of Nam. So Srila Rupa Goswami Pad, he said, Spuranayana Narad Vinod Jivana Sudurmini Ryasa Maduri Pura Tom Krishna Nama Kama Spurane Rasina Rasane Sada. O Nam Prabhu, kindly do spurti, that is, manifest yourself upon my tongue along with Rasa. O So never think that you are chanting or that you can control the name, but always have a very humble mood to Nada Peace more insignificant than a blade of grass and beg for Nam Prabhu to kindly appear. The first step to becoming free from the offenses to the Holy Name we will explain tomorrow. <laughs> so ten offenses we have described and how to overcome them. We will explain tomorrow. Because first is, first understand them and try to give them up. But how to give up the habit of making these offenses habitually? Chaitanya Mahapu himself has Explain. So we'll discuss that tomorrow.